Yona of the Dawn is a series I've probably heard of countless times since I started watching anime again in 2014, whether it be through the manga or this adaptation. So when I randomly rolled it on Crunchyroll for this month's Patreon back series, I was pretty excited to watch it. In today's random Crunchyroll anime, I'll even have my first special guest on this series, longtime friend of the channel and personal friend, Shadowblazer3000, to talk about Yona of the Dawn in this video. As well, he has his own video on his channel, so links will be in the description for his video and his channel. Let's get into it. Let's review Yona of the Dawn. Yona of the Dawn originally premiered on Crunchyroll in 2014 and is based off the manga of the same name by Mizuho Kusanagi, which started publishing in 2009 and currently still publishing as of 2020. It's also surprisingly a shoujo manga, but often will get confused for being a shonen, something I myself have mistakenly called it in the past, and if you remember from my history on this channel, I love shoujo manga and anime as I feel there is something interesting and some innovative stuff always happening within that genre. And oddly enough, Yona of the Dawn is one of those interesting stories. Set in a fictionalized version of Japan, China, and Korea, the nation of Koko, Yona is celebrating her 16th birthday. Her father, King II, is known as a very kind king, unlike the other kings which would only want war or power. But during her 16th birthday, the man Yona is in love with, Suwan, is forbidden from marrying Yona by King II. This sets off a chain of reactions as Suwan murders King II, forcing Yona and her bodyguard Hawk to flee the nation of Koka to eventually one day take back the nation stolen from her family which has now fallen under the rule of Suwan. This is sort of your your typical hero's journey story, one where the hero leaves his or her home to go on an adventure of growth and to gain experience to then come back to the place that she left to achieve their goals. Yona of the Dawn plays pretty well into this and it's quite fascinating to see how Yona as a person grows. Starting out, Yona is very weak physically, can't hold a sword and she can't shoot a bow. Her only worry is really that she just hates her long red hair, which is beautiful, why would she? But by the end of the series she has physically matured, she can shoot a bow and she's even started to practice using a sword. As well, Yona gains the confidence to do these things and to stand up for herself and to do things she wouldn't dare to do like killing an enemy with her bow to save people from being caught by a human trafficker after saving a group of people to be sold off by that very person. Yona is a fantastic main character that starts out as a weak princess and grows into a warrior. Her personal journey is satisfying to see and almost any time Yona is involved, you know you're going to be entertained. But along her journey, she is accompanied by her bodyguard, Hawk. Hawk is actually a very lovable character. If I had to pick my favorites out of the series, Hawk would surely be topping or at the top of that list along with Yona. He is the only person who stands by Yona and the only person who can really understand her struggles. They've been close friends since they were children. But as well, Hawk has sworn to protect Yona no matter, and it shows. He would probably take a bullet or I, I guess I should say an arrow for Yona and being a bodyguard he is trained properly and has some pretty great moments, episode 6 being an early example of this. If Yona is the kind princess, Hawk is the protector, there to closely watch over her every move, something he makes habit of always doing literally and then reminding Yona that he's going to keep doing that. But as well, Yona has the four dragons to protect her. This is a fascinating aspect of Yona of the Dawn. Generations prior, there were four men who swore to protect the king. They would always love this man, always cherish him, and would do whatever is possible to make sure he would be safe. Generations later, Yona is the reincarnation or something to that extent extent of this former king, and there are four people known as the four dragons which have been carried through into this new generation. So much of the first season up until the very last episodes are about establishing and introducing the four dragons. Each of the dragons have their own unique personality, but one thing which they have in common is protecting Yona. First we have Shina, the blue dragon, who doesn't speak much at all and wears a mask, and I apologize if I mispronounced that name, but he's actually rather attractive under that mask as well, adding to the mystery of his character a little bit. As well, he has a pet squirrel, who pretty much becomes Yona's best friend and is your lighthearted relief for many episodes. Secondly, there is Kija, the white dragon, who honestly is the most forgettable dragon of the group in this anime. I was honestly very surprised at this, but yeah, by the end I had just completely forgotten he was there, honestly. 
Maybe it was due to the fact that pretty much every other character outshined him or his role in this part of the story just wasn't that important to begin with. Don't know. Either way, he is just kind of there. Third, Jeha, one of my favorite dragons in Yona of the Dawn. This guy has some of the most charisma out of the four and often has the most comedic moments in the second half of the show. He's probably the most interesting one out of the four immediately because of, well, just that. He's a perv, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's into Hawk, maybe he's also into Yona, maybe is into anything that moves, including the ship captain who is also a little on the older side, though she's pretty cool too. Um, but that's, you know, likely a front that he puts up at the end of the day. Finally, Zeno, who, yeah, just sort of shows up and then the show ends. And I really do mean that. He literally shows up out of the blue and that's pretty much it. Not very interesting, but certainly a unique way to introduce an important character like him. Though, I will be honest, I felt that at the end, while I enjoyed the four dragons for what they were, it was often hit or miss how they actually played out in the season itself. Of course, this is based off a long-running shoujo manga, and you have to consider that in almost six years, this still hasn't gotten a sequel yet. So I do understand that later in the story, these characters will probably be fleshed out way more. But for this series, as of right now, it's hit and miss. Jeha is pretty much the most interesting of the dragons, and everything else is to varying degrees at best. Zeno is the worst, just because of his introduction being so poor. Sheena is very likable, and has the most interesting role outside of Jeha, but just falls short of being more because, well, he doesn't say anything. Then there is the total forgettable Kija who honestly I forgot what, what what his most important character traits are uh that he's cute yeah yeah he's cute to me this is obviously just because there is only a sliver of the total story told but it's still noteworthy that these really important four dragons are not as important as they tell you in this first series it's unfortunate because there is more potential here but this is this is kind of just what we get. And I might as well throw in the healer of the group he here as well, Yoon, while we're at it. He's one of the youngest, but he has the largest ego, often patting himself on the back for how handsome he is, and even at one point dressing up as a woman a la Cloud in Final Fantasy VII, which makes me confused. He isn't featured heavily in this show outside of his introduction into the fold, though, and, you know, of course, dressing up as Cloud, but... As, as I say that, I have a special guest on today's video to talk about Yona of the Dawn with me, fellow YouTuber Shadowblazer3000. Welcome to the show, Shadow. And he's going to tell you what he thinks about Yona of the Dawn, and then we'll kick it back over to me. So take it over, Shadow, and thank you for being on today's review. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I am Shadow Blizzard 3000, coming at you with my fresh mid 2000s era screen name to be a special guest on this video by C Tactics. Now, I actually reviewed Yona of the Dawn shortly after its wrap in early 2015, and while I've had a hell of a time keeping that video up, first having to deal with the usual humdrum of global blocks and then facing down a copyright strike, getting the video back, only for it to mysteriously have gotten blocked again without any notice, thanks YouTube, and having to go through that whole damn process again. Well, minus the strike this time, thankfully. But yeah, go check out that video if you have some time. Hopefully you'll be entertained and also get some more insights into my overall thoughts on the show and some other aspects too. But for now, I'll just give on my quick thoughts for C's video, hey? So Yona of the Dawn came out at a pretty particular time for me and certainly in the anime industry as a whole. In the industry, we had the light novel boom that was taking on with a feverish grip, and of course we had the explosion of streaming media, giving fans all across the globe easier access to shows than ever before, including shows like this one. I mean, this is about the time I remember taking on Crunchyroll as a paid subscriber and instead of just using the free service, and were, you know, relying on torrents. But anyway, for me personally, this show was that glimmer of hope that I needed. After I'd come off a rather dismal experience from Dragon R Academy, and hey, I have a review for that piece of shit too, you can check that out as well. But yeah, a pretty dismal experience with an anime that kind of killed my enthusiasm for the seasonal shows, as well as my longtime favorite studio just gone from the industry, I had pretty much nothing to look forward to anymore. But Yona, well, not single-handedly, it certainly is a part of the reason that kind of rekindled my love of watching new seasonal shows as they come out. And it was everything I could really hope in an adventure anime. It has an interesting main character who has to go on a real difficult journey, who has to transform herself into a new person, and does come out stronger on the other side for it. 
The cocky and at times really bratty princess grows and changes and realizes a few things about herself and the world that she thought she once knew. Being betrayed by someone she thought she loved, finding confidence in someone she thought of as a servant or at best a close friend, learning that her beloved late father, while he may have been a kindly ruler, that kindness unfortunately might have come at a price for his subjects. And that's what Yona of the Dawn is about. It's the transformation of a girl into a woman, as she now has to learn to survive in a hostile world that doesn't look kindly on her or her family, and she has the potential of being tracked down and killed by those she once thought of as her loyal subjects. Will she return to reclaim the throne? Only time will tell with the manga's publication still going, and the anime only covers a small fraction of the story. There is a common complaint I want to address here, and it's one I recall hearing a lot at the show's start, and it's one I've heard from Sea Tactics here as well. People love to say that the show is really slow, or at least it's slow at the start. It is true that the inciting incident that sets Yona out on her journey does take two episodes to really get started, and indeed it does take a while to meet the various dragons who will accompany Yona on her journey. But I think the pace works for a show like this and makes it so very well-rounded. I think when people complain about the show being really slow or being sluggish at the start especially, I think people's perception has largely been jaded by the fact that so many light novels have been made into these relatively short-form shows over the last few years, leading up to Yona and the many more that have come out since. A show like Yona truly harkens back at least a decade, when a show of this length wouldn't be unheard of if not a little bit longer or even longer than this, and have the pace to match, a pace that will properly set the story and the tone that would be needed and that would most likely take a few episodes to really get going. Light novels are, as they say, light. The content's meant to be read, consumed, and moved along in a quick pace, instead of slowly unfold as they would in a more traditional novel or a serialized manga. And given that many of these novels have spawned anime that are roughly 12 or 13 episodes on average, it's no surprise they tend to get into their inciting incidents rather quickly, and they continue to move along, plot beat to plot beat, really quickly, establishing new characters and stakes at every junction, because that's just the nature of their source material. Yona, however, runs real contrary to that, because this is going to be a slow-going journey for Yona, and it's going to be a long, difficult one. That in Medias Ross opening aside, make no mistake, this is going to be a coming-of-age journey for our young heroine. And for a studio that's famous for making many of the long-running staples of Shonen Jump into popular shows, it's really not that big of a surprise that they would adapt Yona at the same leisurely pace, albeit ending after one season as opposed to going on for 10 more years. It's just kind of a shame we couldn't get 10 more years of Yona. Hey, we even take time to revisit our antagonist, Yona's former lover, crosses paths with Yona once more, and, well, in a stunning act of mercy or prudence, I'm not sure, he spares her life when he just as could have easily killed her or turned her in to be killed if he doesn't want to do the dirty deed himself. I can't think of many shows at all that would take time to do something like this. Yona of the Dawn takes its time to carefully craft our main character, the world she lives in, what challenges she'll have to face going on ahead. She's no longer a princess, but she's not content to leave her subjects behind either, and she's not going to take the murder of her father lying down. She's going to grow stronger and take back what is rightfully hers, or at least claim vengeance. That is the mark of a great show, the beginnings of a new adventure. Yona of the Dawn is a great show on that regard. Now see, I throw it back to you. Take it away, buddy. Thank you, Shadow, for that. If you haven't checked out his channel, this guy has been doing videos for almost 10 years, and he only has 800 subs. He has tons of great content and a pretty unique style of video, so please go over, help him out. Watch some of his older videos that have only gotten like five or, I don't know, 10 views just because what for whatever reason it may be. He's got great stuff. He's undiscovered. Help a guy out, and thank you guys for helping him out. Let's just get right back into the review. So, uh, as for Yona of the Dawn, I am sad because this likely won't be getting a second season anytime soon. Pretty much everything about the show is either solid to great, and if by chance it's not something as fun like the show's pacing issues with it being slow in some episodes, then it really seems to be at that point, it comes down to 
personal preference. If you're wondering if I give this anime a recommendation, I give it a 100% recommendation. This anime offers something unique and different that not many other anime can compare to, outside of maybe something like Inuyasha, as they're both shoujo with shonen-like elements, or in other words, they're often confused as shonen. But before we leave, it's time to confirm what the next anime I'll be covering in the next episode of this series where I hit the random button on Crunchyroll is. And the anime we got seems to be a Korean or Chinese property of some sorts, and it's called Fox Spirit Matchmaker. So this should be interesting. This is the first time I'll be covering an anime quite like this on this channel. So if you want access to that review right now, head on over to my Patreon page and sub on the $1 tier and above. This will also give you access to a whole bunch of stuff only exclusive to my Patreon page. So that being said, guys, thank you for watching the video. If you haven't already, like I said, head over to my Patreon. I have a Teespring as well. Give this video a like, comment down below. If you watch Yon of the Dawn or if you are and what your thoughts are on the series, I am really curious to hear about it because this anime isn't often talked about these days. So thank you all for watching. I appreciate it and I'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.